Welcome to this, the second of our online events, which has been de developed specifically for Early Years Teachers. My name's Anne Keenan and I'm the National Officer for Education. I've worked with the EIS for over three years now and took over this role in March this year, just shortly before lockdown. Some of you will know that my background is in primary education. And if you were at our previous event, you'll know that I have a special passion for the early years. So I'm delighted to be here with you this evening to facilitate our conversation on play pedagogy. And I'm here, here keen to hear from you, the experts in the field, about your experiences of reading learning through play in the context of COVID-19. We want your views and experiences to help us as we review and develop practical advice and guidance for members around the value of play. I'm also pleased to welcome Rebecca, who is a nursery teacher in Western Bartonshire, and Michelle, who teaches Primary One in West Lothian. They've been good enough to come along tonight and to start the dialogue by sharing their experiences of learning in their settings, and I'm really grateful for their input. Next slide, please, Pauline. So before I hand you over to Rebecca and Michelle, I thought it would be helpful to give you a brief overview of how we have planned to spend our time together this evening. I'm going to start us off with a, a brief overview of the current Scottish Government and EIS guidance for the early years and set the context for the circumstances in which we're all working. Then, as I've indicated, we're going to hear from our nursery and primary colleagues about their experiences of implementing play pedagogy whilst grappling with the challenges of COVID-19. They'll look at the challenges and opportunities which this has brought in their settings. And finally, there will be an opportunity for you to network, to talk and to share your own experiences. A key feature of this event is to provide the time and space for you to engage with each other, to use your collective experiences to help each other solve problems, to highlight examples of good practice, and just to take that little bit of time to breathe and to chat. Then at the end of the session, we'll take some time in the plenary to draw together some examples of good practice which you've shared, to reflect on the challenges which still exist, and to consider how we can build them into EIS pedagogical guidance and our ongoing representations in the National COVID Education Recovery Group. Finally, we'll set you some homework, but don't worry, we've chosen something nice for you. Next slide, please. So where do we start? As you can see from this slide, there have been a number of publications issued from the Scottish Government and from the EIS since June, and since the Deputy First Minister's announcement that schools would be reopening fully in August of this year. The EIS anticipated that the return to school and nursery on a full-time basis and the road to education recovery would be longer and more arduous than some might have thought in the summer. We knew that recovery from the social, economic and educational impact of the pandemic would require time and that school life in all its aspects would and should look and feel different. To help members to navigate the winding road to recovery, we created a series of guidance documents focusing on the recovery curriculum and the pedagogical adjustments that would need to be made to take account of the public health imperatives. So we developed this initial guidance, and that's exactly what it is, initial guidance, on a sector-specific basis. So there are separate documents for early years, both in terms of risk assessment and pedagogy, and additional separate guidance for primary, secondary and special education, covering both primary and secondary contexts. The EIS guidance takes as a starting point the advice contained in the Scottish Government guidance but builds on this and incorporates EIS policy in all of the areas covered. When we published it early in the term, we said that it would be iterative. We knew that there would be more to come from Scottish Government because we were pressurising them on a number of issues and we knew that members would have more that, um, that they wanted to be guided on as the practical challenges of being back in nursery and school with all pupils in on a full-time basis continued. I'm not sure though, however, that we really realised how iterative the guidance would be. 
As with all things by Irish related, these documents have already changed to take account of the changing Scottish Government guidance. Many of you will be aware of changes in the Scottish Government's early years guidance and if we look at the school's guidance, it was published on the 30th of July and now, about eight weeks into term, we're already on the third version with a fourth awaited imminently. Trying to keep up with the changes is draining. I know how I feel when I see another version coming out, but for you as practitioners working in schools, constantly having to stop and think about your practice, this must just be exhausting. So what we've tried to do in these documents is collate advice for, from different sources, from Education Scotland, um, from the Scottish Government, and from our colleagues who are dealing with outdoor education, um, to create a one-stop shop for members to access current advice. You'll be glad to know that I'm not going to spend today going over the early years and primary EIS guidance section by section. The links to the various documents have been sent to you and you can look at them at your leisure. However, I do want to spend some time exploring the unique position of the early level in the context of Scottish Government guidance. Next slide, please. If I had one message which I would extract from all of these documents and ask you to take away, it's this. Session 2021 is not business as usual, and it shouldn't feel like it is. As you can see from the quote on this slide, even the Scottish Government acknowledged this fact. The starting point must be health and safety, keeping children and young people safe, and importantly, keeping yourselves and your colleagues safe. Without you, there would be no one to deliver the curriculum. Without you, there would be no one to think about pedagogy. Without you, there would be no one to teach the children. And in accepting that these essential health and safety considerations are the starting point, we also need to accept that much will be different and will remain so for the foreseeable future in terms of how settings operate, in terms of the physical environment, and in terms of how we deliver teaching and learning to our youngest learners. It will have implications for how children move around settings and classrooms, to how play-based learning opportunities are planned, to how hygiene and cleaning is arranged. And this is necessary as we endeavour to keep children and staff safe in a COVID secure setting. Next slide, please. So underpinning practice in both nursery and schools is the risk assessment process. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with the guidance on risk assessments which we've produced for early year settings as well as for schools. And some of you may already have attended the risk assessment webinars which were delivered in June and then again at the beginning of term. The guidance props EIS representatives and members to think about the issues in their own settings and ask questions as part of the risk assessment and the review process. If you're unsure whether something has been considered, raise it with your local EIS health and safety representative or ask to see the school risk assessment. Once risks have been identified, the process should then consider whether the risks can be managed safely and if so, what risk mitigation measures need to be adopted. The, the combination of risk mitigation measures is especially important when the risk posed is high and multiple strategies are needed to manage that risk. So in some cases, it might be necessary to wear face coverings, have enhanced hand hy hygiene measures in place and plan for the delivery of teaching in smaller groups or perhaps even use PPE. But the process doesn't stop there because the risk assessment should be reviewed on a regular basis and if circumstances change in your setting. Next set slide, please. In considering the risks, I can't move on without addressing um, the elephant in the room, physical distancing in the early years. The Scottish Government guidance documents to which I've referred have left us with the situation in which colleagues in nurseries are advised not only that they are not required to adhere to the two metre physical distancing rules, but that it would be inappropriate to expect young children to do so. Whilst I'm sure that we all appreciate the practicalities of seeking to impose physical distancing with these young learners, 
as well as the issues which arise around child development. We must also recognise that this places nursery teachers in a different position from other teachers and indeed from colleagues teaching in primary one and in other parts of the school where the two metre physical distancing rules apply. In relation to primary one, the Scottish Government guidance does state that schools may consider making use of the early learning and child care models when managing children's interactions and appropriate mitigations where, where appropriate, particularly when adopting a play-based um, approach. So this creates an anomaly. The EIS has raised this anomaly consistently through discussions in the various education recovery groups and campaigned for sufficient resources and smaller class sizes to enable physical distancing to be possible and to facilitate more meaningful engagement with learners as part of education recovery. However, so far, in response, scientific evidence on the level of transmission from younger children has been cited. But as with all things virus related, new evidence is always emerging and we are monitoring the developments in this area very closely. The current provisions and the anomaly between nursery and the early years of primary, and in fact between nursery and the rest of the school context, do not sit easily with us. Where the early years approach is adopted, the EIS is clear that the additional risk mitigation measures identified through risk assessment processes must be put in place to ensure the health and well-being of staff as well as of pupils. If a teacher in early years within the school or early year setting is concerned about the mitigation measures which have been identified and has concerns about their safety or the safety of anyone else in the setting, they should raise this with the management team and seek advice and support from their EIS school representative. Next slide, please. So now we turn to pedagogy and ask why, why play? All children and adults, parents, teachers and support staff will undoubtedly have been affected in some way by the pandemic. Confinement, restricted social interaction, illness, bereavement, unemployment, poverty, food insecurity, financial worries, media reporting of the virus, all of these will have made their mark to varying degrees on individuals, families and communities. The EIS has been clear that lockdown and with it the closure of schools and um, early learning settings has wreaked the most damage upon children and families who are most disadvantaged by social inequality. As we embark on the road to education recovery, we can't forget our youngest learners and must invest in early intervention measures as we seek to develop the holistic needs of these children and address the gaps resulting not only from the impact of the pandemic, but also from poverty and socio-economic disadvantage. The Scottish Government makes it clear that in re-engaging children in early years education, the same pedagogical approach which we've long ad adopted, so that of child-centred play-based learning, should continue to apply. And I think as practitioners, you would all agree with that approach. So it's no surprise to see the Scottish Government guidance on reopening early year settings, highlighting the reasons why this is important. Through play, we support children to form secure and emotionally resilient attachment bases to help them as they grow and develop. Through play, we create an environment in which children will flourish through nurturing and attached relationships. Through play, we enable children to interact with their peers to meet their physical, social, emotional and cultural needs. And through play, we as teachers can have a clear focus on the wellbeing indicators and scaffold experiences to help our youngest learners reach their potential. But the play-based approach does not stop there. And I'm delighted to say that it also features in the guidance on education recovery in schools. That guidance recommends that time is specifically earmarked to maximise opportunities for communication and dialogue with children, young people and their families, and to continue to build relationships and resilience. It goes on to state that the benefits of play and outdoor learning will be factored into learning plans, including opportunities for learners to be physically active, to enjoy and learn about their natural environment, and to relax. 
This guidance is not only for the lower primary, but for all stages. So it's, a really po it's really positive to see play being valued and being given such a prominent place in promoting the health and well-being of children and young people and in seeking to bridge the gaps in learning arising from the pandemic and from the impact of socio-economic disadvantage. This approach is not new to early years and we need to acknowledge the experience which you as early years teachers bring to education recovery in the current context. Next slide, please. And we talked about this when we met last and we were looking at the distinct professional identity of early years teachers. But I just think it's worth reiterating and revisiting now that we really need teachers working across the early years. And this slide highlights some of the positives which are associated with that. As part of early years practice, teachers are mindful of the holistic development of the child. They are ready to identify special needs and use early intervention strategies to support young children. They're used to working with other professionals around the child. And I'm sure that many of you here this evening will already be engaging with educational psychologists, with social workers, um, as you're trying to address and deal with the impact of the pandemic on nurture and attachment. Teachers are experienced in sustaining those important family links and are mindful of the fact that many families will have been dealing with trauma and poverty. But over, overall, GTCS registered, registered teachers in the early years have the confidence in the value of learning through play. Next slide, please. And so your voices should absolutely be central to the discussions in which priorities are set in your nursery or school. The well-being of children, teachers and families is to be at the forefront of all decision making during this initial period of education recovery. Teachers in schools and in early learning and childcare settings should not expect nor feel under pressure to begin the new session as it would any other. We should be working together to streamline priorities and ensure that there is a clear focus on health and well-being. Education Scotland has recognised this in their publication, Being Me Through Adversity and Trauma. They highlight that in supporting our youngest learners, we need to consider the impact of the adverse and traumatic experiences, which may well have influenced and, and them, and which they will have faced through the pandemic, and acknowledge that children in early years returning to nursery and school are likely to need additional social and emotional support. Now more than ever, the importance of a strong collegiate approach is central to supporting the children across the early level, but also in supporting the health and well-being of colleagues during this transition period. In developing this approach, the EIS recommends that time is set aside to facilitate meaningful discussions around pedagogy with others in the setting, and to agree as a collective how these central priorities around health and well-being can best be delivered. This may involve consideration of layout to facilitate the safe flow of play for smaller groups of children and of how collegiate planning and professional dialogue can take place with appropriate physical distancing between adults to ensure that learning opportunities are responsive to children's interests and needs. In moving forward with a clear rationale and shared understanding of the value of play, a focus can be placed on the holistic needs of children within the setting. Although it's clear that the same approach to teaching and learning will continue in the early years, as I indicated at the beginning of this session, we must recognise that in delivering this safely, important health and safety measures require to be adopted and reviewed in the weeks and in the months to come. Next slide, please. Now that I've talked about the guidance, you'll be glad to hear that it's time to turn to the operation of play and practice um, in the practitioner-led um, element of this section. We're going to hear from our brave volunteers about how they have managed in their setting to adopt and to, to adapt the play pedagogy against a background of health and safety measures. We're going to start with Rebecca, who will tell us about her experience of developing the play pedagogy for session 2021 in our nursery. And then she's also going to deliver um, some additional slides which she has um, developed in conjunction with one of her colleagues, Helen, 
who is responsible for health and safety and as an EIS health and safety rep in her nursery um, to look at how we can manage teacher wellbeing. So a huge thank you to Rebecca for this and then we'll move on to hear from Michelle about how Play is operating in Primary 1 in her school.